welcome to Speaking of Jazz with Manny Kellogg and in association with jazztribe.news. Now let's get started. Well, hello, jazz lovers. Once again, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you might be listening to this show. Just like to remind you, you're listening to Speaking of Jazz with me, Manny Kellogg. I'm your host. I'm coming to you each week with a uh, different guest, whether it might be a jazz vocalist, a musician, or what have you, a producer. And most of all, I want to thank you all so much for, lo- for uh, listening to the show each week. And uh, before we get into it, what I'd like to do is just acknowledge the fact in the last uh, month or so, we have lost three jazz giants. We lost Joy DeFrancesco, Ramsey Lewis, and just the other day, Farrell Sanders. We lost him. And i just like to pay tribute to them brothers right now. Their names will live on. They're not with us in spirit, but the music is going to be with us forever. And on that note, today I have a legend with me. The man has been uh, 40 years in the uh, educational business. He's a mentor as well, recording artist, and a saxophonist, jazz saxophonist. I'd like to welcome to the show this week my good friend, Mr. Herb Smith. How you doing, man? Talk to me. Yeah, hanging on, hanging in. <laughs> yeah, man, dig it. It's, it's so good to have you on the show, man. We've been trying to put this thing together for uh, almost six months now. Ain't that about right? Yep. We finally got it. You know, I'll, I've never really had a chance to sit down and talk to you. I've heard so much about you from uh, my good friend, bass player, Mr. Emery Diggs. And uh, I want to thank him for introducing us and putting this thing together. I would like to start, man, and just allow you to uh, talk to us, let our guests know, let me know where are you from, man, and who are some of your most uh, influences as you came along the way. Go ahead, man. It's your show. Oh, good heavens. <laughs> uh, well, I was born in Decatur, Alabama. Okay. okay. Where uh, I guess I remained until the age of two. Mm-hmm. Parents moved back to Memphis. Uh, and Memphis is where I grew up. And people have heard a lot about Memphis. I guess even greater than that in terms of all of the the details. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I was always in a so-called musical environment. I lived across the street from a sanctified church. Oh, oh, yes. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> during the weekdays and nights, peddlers would come up and down the street peddling whatever. It could be a rag man. And uh, as little kids, we would run after the, the watermelon man or the rag man. Yeah. Or the ice man. Everybody, some kind of tune that they would try to sing to get attention to let you know that they were there or either they were coming. And so it was always interesting uh, listening to all this creativity. And we would try to imitate some of these uh, folks. So I I have a lot of memories uh, of the things that led or that lead into music. Okay. Even something as fundamental as the way you walk. Hmm. Yeah, everybody had to have a walk. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And of course, you know, that involves... uh, rhythm and it may even have melody also because you may be uh singing singing while you're walking oh yeah so you know there was a musician at a certain institution where i wound up teaching he had been teaching there so uh he even has some famous students that had a tune called walking in rhythm okay okay yeah singing a song Maybe I may uh, uh, inform everybody that I was uh, born in Decatur, Alabama. 
And uh, my mother, she was going through delivery, was listening to a radio program. And that's how she spontaneously came up with a name for me. Okay, tell us about that. <laughs> yeah, she was listening to this, I guess it was like a detective. And the actor was uh, the British actor, Herbert Marshall. She liked the way his voice sounded. Okay. So she decided to name me Herbert after Herbert Marshall. And the funniest thing is that before I even knew this, I liked his voice. Okay. And uh, see, we, we are those kind of people that have these sensibilities to, uh, to listen, be spiritual, and to be spontaneous. And so I think that's been the story of my life to uh, be spontaneous, because I don't always know what's going to happen. That's right. You know, I don't know who I'm going to be. I don't know where I'm going to be. And I've been improvising all my life. The funny thing is that I never looked for a job. I want this or that job, so I'm going to go looking for it. Uh, somehow, I guess I'm moving slowly enough that the that the jobs came to me. Yeah, yeah. And by the way, what you are doing, which is and good, but you you might not have known, I had two radio programs in St. Louis. Jazz okay. shows. Okay. And uh, what I would do, and this was one of the early Pacifica stations, and if I thought they got something wrong, the hosts and whoever were presenting information, I would call the station. Mm -hmm. And so I got to, I would call the station all the time and they say, oh, well, you, you are that guy. Yeah, yeah, you are that professor, you are that. I said, yeah. And uh, they said, well, go ahead and correct us or help us understand what we're, what we're trying to say or add to it. Okay. So every time I would call, they would say, can we talk to you afterwards? And I said, oh, okay. They offered me a radio program. Why don't you have your own radio program? Since you know so much. And I'd say, oh, no, I don't have time. Uh, I was really afraid at the time. I just wanted to help. I didn't need yeah. a show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> At the radio station, they wanted to have a program celebrating the life of John Coltrane. Mm -hmm. Ironically, somebody lifted all of their train recordings, this record collections in St. Louis. Well, can you lend us, you know, your John Coltrane offerings? I said, well, no, but I'll bring them there. <laughs> and when I leave, I must have them with me. And they said, well, what do you mean? I said, well, remember, somebody stole off John Coltrane. And I said, I want to help. So I went down, and they put a microphone in front of me. I said, <laughs> I just I just came to lend you to, to play the records. Yeah, yeah. I, I don't want to say anything. And they would get to a certain point, and the, uh, the host of the show would stop and say, isn't that right, Herb? And I would say, yeah, <laughs> but I didn't want, you know, to be on a show. I did. Then they say, you need your own show. I said, oh, no, 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 no. They said, we'll teach you how to run the equipment and to get a license. I said, I don't know. So I, I came down and this went on for a few weeks or so. And they said, yeah. Well, pretty soon, you know, you you're gonna you're gonna know how to operate things, and you you're gonna have your license. And uh, this one night, I thought everybody was in place operating the equipment. Left and left me there. <laughs> <laughs> and man, I was scared. My program was called Jazz and All of the Related Things. And by the way, on that program, I wound up uh, doing a recorded interview with Leon Thomas. 
which was, man, mind-blowing and very inspirational. And I also interviewed my homeboy, George Coleman, who, by the way, was very suspicious of me. When I would ask him questions, he was like, who is this weird so-called <laughs> educator? You know, uh, finally, George warmed up to me. But by the way, we, George Coleman and I attended the same high school, though he's close to nine years older than I am. Okay. And this all ties in with one of the questions you asked me. Get a load of this. The high school I attended had George Coleman, Frank Strozier, um, Book a Little, myself, Isaac was a year old, Isaac Hayes. Really? Went to the same high school. Some of the cast of characters played with Miles Davis. And as they did, Miles was recorded as having said, that must have been the greatest jazz school in the world. But guess who taught there? Well, let me finish with who all attended. Gerald Wilson attended Manassas High School. Sonny Chris, the great Jimmy Lunsford taught there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Jimmy Lunsford really is the king of swing. <laughs> and get a load of the courses he taught. He taught typing, he coached basketball, and he ran the jazz band. Students in his band were so good that he left with them and went on the road and became the great Jimmy Longsford. Okay. Oh man. And so, you had you had a power a powerful lineup at your high school. Yeah. Uh one, two of the rivals to Julian Cannonball Adley went to the school. Emerson Abel was my teacher. Andy Goodrich was really a, the teacher for uh, Charles Lloyd, Frank Strozier, and Hank. And he came to the D.C. area where he stayed for a good while and he played. Uh, Andy Goodrich. And I was very close to Aunt, Aunt Goodrich. Now, my band director's best friend was a fellow who came to D.C. Maine for many years, the great Calvin Jones that wound up teaching at, um, I guess they renamed it to Federal City, but he taught jazz over there and was a fantastic jazz trombone teacher. So David Yalber and some of these people uh, ran into uh, Cal. So um, that's some of my background. Oh, and I was very close to Phineas Newbern really probably the greatest jazz pianist. And um, I was just amazed. Did you, work, did you work with Phineas? No, but I, I carried him around. He stayed at my house for a couple of weeks in Alexandria because he was uh, on a tour. He played here in D.C. at Blues Alley, and then he was going to go to New York. So rather than go back home, he stayed with me in Alexandria, and I introduced him to some of the local musicians, Wade Beach. I called up Wade and said, hey, how would you like to meet Phineas Newman? He said, what? I said, <laughs> yeah, Phineas Newman. He says, what do you mean? I said, are you playing? And, and Wade would play nightly at, this was a club in Alexandria. He said, yeah. I mean, he couldn't believe it. He was, he was, I mean, how did I meet all these people? I mean, it wasn't any kind of conscious decision on my mind. Yeah, yeah. You know, oh, I'm Phineas. I became very close to Phineas. And I would take some students down to meet stu uh, uh, Phineas. It's funny. Uh, Phineas was a very sensitive guy. You know, I of a closeness to him. Okay. Because Phineas was so great that to be that great and try to function sometimes as, as just an ordinary average person is kind of tricky. But 
uh, Phineas always would gravitate toward me because it was sort of like I would, I don't know, run interference <laughs> or clear the way. <laughs> Well, on, on that on that note, can you uh, share with us some of the uh, some of the some of the other some of the jazz artists, some people artists you've had a, had the opportunity of working with in your in your lifetime, your career? Um, encountering mostly um, when I was at Howard University, you know, I was Donald Byrd's replacement. Supposedly. Yes. Yes. And uh, I had to save their curriculum because uh, they were having different issues. And uh, so they brought me in quickly uh, to, to keep the students there and to make sure that they had and could maintain the degree program and their certification. So it's like, there I am. I really didn't want to come uh, to Howard, but I had a, a childhood friend of Miles Davis, Janetta Haley. She says, Herb, you've got to go. I said, I, but I'm 300 miles from my town. I'm 300 miles from Kansas City, where I went to school. I'm 300 miles from Chicago. And I'm 300 miles from Indianapolis. I feel very safe. I, I, I'll just write these things up and give it to them. So the head of the music program, Relford Patterson at the time, he said, but you got to come, you got to come. You got to go and you got to make history. By the way, I worked with uh, Vernon Davis, Miles Davis, like him. He was a dancer with the great choreographer, Catherine Dunham, who was a co-worker of mine. And uh, man, I was very secure in St. Louis. By the way, Julius Hemphill, Lester Bowie, Oliver Lake, Hammond Blewett was there. Uh, and I'm trying to think of this other little player who wound up playing on Saturday Night Live. Uh, what's his name? But all of us were rivals in St. Louis. And in St. Louis, I ran into Oliver Nelson. I studied with him. Yeah. Some. And, and you can see everywhere I went, I was running into somebody that, you know, included me in the stuff they were doing. Either I'd hang around them. Uh, I didn't get a chance to necessarily play a lot. I spent a couple of weeks with Horace Silver because I was very close to Carmel Jones from Kansas City. And Carmel had just joined the band. Joe Henderson, this was their first week's Lex Humphrey. And Teddy Smith was a bass player uh, from St. Louis. So I, I was in Boston with them for a couple of weeks, every night listening to them. And after they would play, we would go out and eat. And of course I was much thinner then. Back in them days, I know what you're saying. Horace Silver, I mean, to really make me feel good and include, had the nerve to call me Memphis Slim. <laughs> 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 and he got so he would make jokes uh, I innocently asked them because they were talking and laughing and they said yeah uh, such and such a person really likes Kansas City wrinkles and so I innocently asked what's Kansas City wrinkles and uh, Horace laughed I mean he was just cracking up so they broke down and told me that, and the way Horace said it was uh, chitterlings, <laughs> you, you know, and you can, I mean, so there I am. And along with me was Johnny Hodges Jr. 
the son, he was a drummer of Johnny Hodges. We at the time were both Berkeley students. I had won a scholarship to the jazz school, Berkeley in Boston. And as I was saying before, I'm just kind of floating along and all of a sudden I'm included in this, that, and the other. Anyway, when I, when I went to Howard, uh, we decided uh, to bring Sonny Rollins for a week. And we got him at a bargain, by the way. And it was my job when he flew in to, to pick up Sonny from the airport. Okay. So on the way to the airport, I'm saying to myself, now you're not going to mention train when you're talking to Sonny. So I pick up Sonny and I'm so happy to meet him and we're talking. I bet you it wasn't five minutes and I mentioned train because I wasn't really sure, you know, how Sonny would feel because Sonny was great and is because he still lives. He, he's not playing uh, much these days. Mm -hmm. Sonny Rollins, oh my God, a giant. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm driving the car and Sonny in this high, higher voice than most people can imagine. He leans over and says to me, Train died for the music. And I'm going, oh, I mean, these are the kind of things that these people would say to me that's very human. And when I get Sonny to the hotel where he's staying and he's getting situated. There's two couches in this hotel room. I'm sitting on one, Sonny sits on the other with his arms folded. And he says to me, so you think you can teach jazz? And he's serious. And I'm going, uh, uh, I'm saying, yeah. And he folds his arms even more than they were folded. <laughs> and he says to me, how? And I'm scared to death. I'm saying, damn, we brought him here. And he's saying, well, how? I said, the principal way to teach jazz is to recreate the same environment, environment or as close to it as we can as to the environment that was conducive to you. He looks at me and said, what do you mean? I said, that's why we brought you here. He said, and I said, I want the students to run with you, hang with you, talk to you, eat lunch with you, eat dinner with you, yeah, and yeah. jam. I said, do you know why? He said, well, why? I said, so they can understand how to become maybe a great musician in the tr tradition that you are. Because when you say John Coltrane or when you say Sonny Rollins, people go, oh, my God, oh, without knowing that you guys still are human and you were human, even when you weren't John Coltrane, even right. if, when you weren't. And he kind of said, well, I said, look, first of all, if they are afraid of their own shadows. They know that you guys have worked so hard and have become great. They don't know how to do that. Well, well, how do you do that? But if they saw you as a human being and the fact that you have a sense of humor and the fact that you do what they do, you gotta eat, you gotta relax, you gotta think, you practice. I right, said, I'm right. I want, I want them to see you practice. He goes, really? And in one of our sessions, somebody asked Sonny, when did you know you were great? Sonny said, I didn't. Mm. And the room went, what? Sonny said, I didn't think I was great or good. He said, Bud Powell told me I could play. He said, I didn't think I could play. He said, then Bird told me I could play. He said, I didn't want to argue with him. <laughs> <laughs> Since they said that, 
He said, I, I accepted it. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I said, well, this is what I want the students to know if they can be around you, to, to know that same path of the human condition, the human condition you go through and your humanity. They just think you are a God. They think you fly out of the sky playing this way. Yeah, they, yeah. They don't know that John Coltrane uh, was running around with white socks on and Naima, uh, somebody was telling him, now we got to go hear this person and this person. She was so instrumental in supporting Train and telling him who is and who isn't maybe. But do we have any of that? Do we have a Naima that's telling us, telling us, hey, you need to listen to this guy. Uh, you need to be playing this or that tune. So Train, believe it or not, as quiet and as shy as he was, had the right kind of groupie to, to tell him what to listen to, how to listen, what was good. I mean, aesthetically. And sometimes, suppose we don't have a naive. <laughs> you know, somebody yeah, yeah. that encourages us and somebody that journeys with us. In other words, they let you run with them. Sometimes if you don't have that, you may not know or you may not develop what you have. In my view, most people could probably become good musicians, if not great musicians, if they not only had themselves, but suppose they had somebody who would show them without even lecturing to them, show them how to do how to function every day. Mm -hmm. Like, like, what do you do? You know, how, how do you cope? You know, I had to tell my students, look, uh, John Train wrote Giant Steps as an exercise. He, yeah. didn't, he didn't write that as a tune where he was thinking, oh, I'm going to record this someday. And when I do, it's going to scare the hell out of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> because they're going to try to play it. Train wrote this as an exercise and practiced it for five years. I guess it got so good to Train. Train said, damn it, I got, I got to go in the studio with this. Got to put this down, yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it wasn't like, okay, he just wrote it and he was dee do dee do dee. It didn't happen like that. And this is what people don't know. And when Leon Thomas was telling me in an interview I had with him, he says, you know, you must find freedom within your chains. I'm going, what? He says, yeah, you got to find freedom within your chains. I said, boy, boy, boy. He said, and by the way, he didn't think there was any such thing as talent. I said, well, damn, what, what do you mean? He says, if we practice long enough and well enough, it may wind up being our ancestors speaking through us. Oh, boy. Man, I was going, whoa, run that past <laughs> me again. That's, that's, that's heavy, man. He says, yeah. when you play well, it's because you have practiced enough that whatever you wind up playing is second nature. Yes. That's a part of you. But suppose we never play long enough, and that, that is to say practice and works towards something. But see, in addition to my father, who I thought was the fiercest worker that ever lived in the world, I would just watch him mop the floor, and I could not imagine anybody being as intense. The only other person I thought of that was as intense as my father mopping the floor, and that was John Coltrane. Later on, I discovered Malcolm X. Uh, we were arguing about, you know, Malcolm. And one person said, you know, Malcolm read the dictionary from cover to cover four times. Hey. When I heard that, I'm in college, and somebody looks at me and said, what's wrong with you? 
I said, I have not gotten through the A's, <laughs> not <laughs> once. Well, who is John Coltrane? Who is Malcolm? What kind of discipline? And by the way, Malcolm was somewhat familiar with train and train familiar with Malcolm. That can you be that purposeful on a level of a Sonny Rollins and stick with it and become one with your instrument? I mean, wow. And for me, I always sought out these people. I always sought out Yousef Latif because I said, wow, that guy knows something. Yeah, yeah. You know, very spiritual, very dedicated, and it blew my mind when he at times didn't have a horn and he carved out on a broomstick the, the keys for a saxophone and he would just, in high school, he would finger because at a time he didn't even own he would, can you imagine that? He did that on a broomstick. Yeah. Amazing. And I'm saying, my, my, my. So I didn't have nothing to com complain about. Man. Well, I, I have a question for you there, doctor. What was it like? Then we're going to take a, take a short pause. What was it like to be in, in the company of uh, Sonny Rollins? Amazing because... He's just fundamentally a human being. Yeah. Well, did you get a chance to uh, study with him and, and, and uh, sit with him at all? Yeah, to be with him, but I never really had a chance to have my horn out with him. He would tell me things that you'd have to be close to him. In other words, he thought I was receptive. And he would ask me questions. Like I, I went to New York to see him. He had a thing at Carnegie Hall and he wanted me to be there. See, it, it, it was like that. It wasn't like me with my horn playing is that here is this friendship. Mm -hmm. uh, he met me at the hotel where we were staying. and. He saw my car, which was a Volvo. Now, here's Sonny. It's like he's asking me about the Volvo. He says, well, uh, why do you like it? Now, here's Sonny, the great Sonny Rollins, but he's practical enough and human enough to say, is this a good car? And I'm saying, yes. And he's asking me, well, why? <laughs> Why do I think it's that way? You know, th th these are things that we shared. And he asked me, what did I think of his group? Uh, when he brought one group down, and I can't remember the club that they were playing. It, it's many years defunct. Uh, and he asked me, what do you think of the bass player? And I, this is the way Sonny is talking to me. Yeah, yeah you know, is that we hit a chord. First of all, he knew I cared. And he, when he was at going to go to the Carnegie kind of Hall, he says, can you come see me? I hmm. said, well, yeah. He said, I'll have tickets. There'll be tickets waiting for you. So I brought my family. You know, this was important to him. I mean, I wasn't a super, super, I wasn't a super well-known recording artist, but what does that say about Sonny? He was a regular person. Yes. Yes. And this and is he, he, he valued from what from what I'm getting from you, he valued their friendship. Yes. And he would talk to me. And he would ask me, did I know uh, Oliver Lake? He he found out that Oliver Lake knew me. Hammett blew it, Oliver Lake, Lake, Julius Hemphill, and all those folks, they knew me from St. Louis. Uh, David Sanborn was a rival, rival of mine. Okay. And it was funny, some kid was sitting next to me one day, and he says to me, well, wow, I know who you sound like. And I said, you do? He said, <laughs> 
you sound like David Sanborn. I lean into him and I said, no, 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 no. David Sanborn sounds like me. <laughs> he, he's going, he said, you knew David? I said, yeah, I know him. I said, he had polio and so he punches over a certain way as he playing. But the people who might not have had that condition that's there, they're hunching over because of David Sanborn. But they don't you know, know why. You know, I, I noticed when I saw you play, I noticed uh, the way that you were standing and uh, you were kind of leaning old yeah. school. You were leaning way, but you were leaning so you were leaning so far back it almost looked like you were sitting back on the stool. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and it's funny, but you know who would do that? Is Miles Dewey Davis? Yeah, yeah. I mean that guy. I mean it's just funny. My phone is acting up, but don't pay any attention to it. I'm going. Ignore. That's all right. Go ahead. We're, we're going to take a quick break here and remind our guests uh, that they're listening to Speaking of Jazz with me, Manny Kellogg, and I'm your host, and I'm bringing you uh, real live jazz artists. Uh, every week, which might be a piano player, producer, vocalist. I'm coming from the hip. I'm doing it live and, and the real stuff every week. There's no sugarcoating going on here. And it's being uh, brought to you by Daryl Craig Harris and Music Matters. And he's in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. He's one of our producers. And also Nigel J. Farmer. Jazz Tribe News, and he's in Southwest France, who is our producer and as well as uh, our publisher. Again, you're listening to Speaking of Jazz with me, Manny Kellogg. I'm your host every week. And if you'd like to be a guest on the show, all you have to do is email me at speakingofjazz.guest at gmail.com. That's speakingofjazz.guest at gmail. Dot com. Again, you're listening to uh, Speaking of Jazz, Manny Kellogg, and uh, I'm, I'm coming to you every week with some brand new people, and I want to thank my listeners for tuning in and downloading and enjoying us every week. With that being said, uh, we're running short on time, so I got to dive right back in here with my uh, guest this week, who is uh, Dr. Herb Smith, saxophonist. Dr. Smith, you still with me? Yeah. Man, let's continue on right where you left off, man. Yeah. Uh, I did a couple of, uh, and I've got to locate them, a couple of podcasts on how to listen to jazz. Okay. And uh, a lot of the students, they just say, well, well, you just, I said, no, I was lucky. My jazz education is connected with specific people. Like I have a cousin in Chicago that's six years older than I am. He's about the same height as Miles. He thought he was Miles. <laughs> and He's thinking like Miles. Yeah, and he would he'd be, try to talk like Miles, but, but he loved Miles. Yeah, yeah. And so he says, oh, what are you into? What are you into? Uh, he says, are you into Miles? I said, yeah, early miles. He says, well, why aren't you into? And I'm saying, well, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trying to get there. I said, you know, I, I, I like the cool miles. My, <laughs> the cool my miles. Cousin, yeah, and he was saying, oh, oh. so he'd go around saying, so what? When people are talking, so what and why and all this kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And the way I came to appreciate, in an emotional, aesthetic sense, kind of blue, was because of my cousin, who thought he was Miles. Okay. He said, yeah, me and my boys, we go down to the Southern, Southern lounge, in, lounge in Chicago. We got to see Miles. And says, Miles had that mute on his horn, and he put that mute on top of the microphone. I yeah. said, I said, he didn't. He didn't. He looks at me and said, were you there? I said, I said, no. He said, well, then shut up. 
I said, but didn't it distort the sun? He says, no. And when he would come home from work as I was visiting in Chicago, he put on kind of blue and he's standing in the middle of the room like he's Miles Davis. Okay. And he would he would walk, he would float the same way, you know, the way he would move. This is how I could understand Miles' music. It's not just even as a musician, let me put it to you this way. A musician may ask another musician how to hear Miles. To me, the best way to totally hear somebody like Miles or Train is to study the people who understand and who digest this music. If you, by yourself, try to do this, you may miss it. Because as a musician, what am I interested in? Am I interested in how many notes does he play? Yeah, yeah. Uh, or did he play the D7 chord with a blah, blah, blah. But if you are an emotionally truthful connoisseur, you hear the whole thing and you are affected by it. Sometimes musicians... We have our own preferences and our biases. And so we may not know. Or we run right past what a non-musician may appreciate. Uh, I had this one cousin, his wife, she's listening to this music. And Chuck Israel is playing bass. And it's from the album of Ponciana. Uh. But not for me. I, I love that walk. tune. I, okay. I love it. I love it. I love it. Well, guess what they were doing? Now I'm about I'm 16 years old. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at her, and man, she is out of sight. So I'm saying, damn, and when I grew up, I want one of them too. <laughs> you know, talking about her. <laughs> she was singing. She would go boom to de to de doom boom to do to de the bass part. Okay. And then she would ah and then pop her fingers. They had the nerve to loan me some records. I would take those records home and play. And when I would go through those different sections, I knew how they responded popping their fingers in this measure and going, ooh, all yeah, this stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I had all of that stuff. It wasn't just me by myself. I knew what got them. Now, somebody like Miles, a train, they're so spiritually conscious. They not only are aware of themselves and what the music means to them, they know how their music maybe affected the people to the extent that people couldn't control themselves. They couldn't help themselves, <laughs> you know. But sometimes a musician by his or herself are only looking at certain technical things. Okay. They're not looking at the aesthetics. What is the emotional content and effect of that? But you got, we got to put the whole thing together. How does Miles Davis know how to play one note and just make you just melt? <laughs> <laughs> you know, now, yeah, yeah. If, if left up to my ego, I'd run past that note. I'm going all past it because I'm trying to impress the, the musicians. But we got to play for more than the musicians. We got we gotta, we gotta, we gotta to play to the people. Yeah, we got to play yes. to the spiritual, the musicians who are spiritual. And by the way, I met Cannonball, good heaven, about six times, and we talked to him a little bit. And man, I love that guy because he knew how to get to the people. And at first, when I was reading, he didn't like recording in the studio because the people weren't there. Right, right. He wanted to record live. Live, live. So the people, you could hear him saying, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> you, you know, and you hear somebody saying, yeah. <laughs> like you like that feedback, man. That we yeah. all want, you know, I when I'm on stage, I'm I'm playing so I can feel, I want to send my feeling out to the audience and I want to get it to come back. Yeah. That's but where see, I'm coming from. The audience, cannibal say he needs the audience to push him. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? To, to, and he would he would say that on his recording, said we are recording live. Yeah. To, and you remember the famous uh, Art Blakey, mm -hmm. where the announcer says, we're recording live, and your your hands may be on the recording. <laughs> 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 you know, you're clapping. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and all of this. And that and that caused them that caused the audience to get more into it. Yeah. <laughs> well, see, that's the impact that the music had, the spiritual, uh, and I don't forget that, because as a little kid growing up, uh, sometimes I would hear, you know, listeners saying, take your time, take your time, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, uh, I preach, yeah. <laughs> uh, come on with it, Doc, come on, come on. with it. <laughs> That's a sermon, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you could talk in a jazz performance if you encourage the musicians. But now if you had some conversation that was off the wall distracting, you know, then that's not welcome. But if what you're doing is inspiring and encouraging the musician and that you're relating to what they're doing, I'm telling you, this is what the music is supposed to, to do. And when I was interviewing Leon Thomas, I could get come back to that African aesthetic context of what a performance could be, which not only involved the musicians, but the audience. And all of this is so important. Yes, Sometimes it is. Sometimes the people forget, the musician may forget in their calculations. In other words, they're saying, I'm going to write this real hip tune. But it's like you got your mojo working. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Smith said, uh, I tried it in New York City, and now I'm going to try it out on you. Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. The musicians has to be aware when they're playing that if it affects the, the people such that they can't help themselves. I mean, they just... You already know. I mean, and they are inspiring you. They are pushing you. They are telling you that they need you. Yeah, yeah. And this is why I was always drawn to what's called jazz, which to me is the, this is the most profound expression, principally of African people, but it's open to everybody that can orientate themselves to that kind of connection. And it, it was no excuse, uh, no accident rather, that people when hearing say Sarah Vaughn, mm -hmm. they say she's the divine one. Yes. You know, we are divine when we play, when, yeah, and when yeah. we are sincere in that play. You know, and, and, and the people can tell when we're sincere with what we're doing as well. Yeah. And when we're faking, you know, they 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 can tell when we're faking ain't nothing happening. You they know, can't, they, they can can't tell it, they can tell it before we it's just as fast as we can tell it. Yeah, you know? they 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 can't help it. I got a question for you as we're 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 running out of time here. What are Doc, what are you currently uh doing? Are you working on any recording? Are you performing anywhere? Can you talk briefly about that? Yeah, well. From the very beginning for me, and there were others, but it stood out in my mind that I've been chasing bird, and I still am. But in the middle of trying to chase bird, and I'm speaking of Charlie Parker. Right, right. Up comes this John Coltrane boy. So I'm chasing the bird, <laughs> the train. I'm chasing Cannonball. I'm chasing all of them. Okay. You, you know what I mean? To find out. 
How you do that? How they do that? You know, I'm listening and then the African languages and culture, I'm looking for the juju, <laughs> the, the magic of that. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, and it doesn't matter who it is. You know, I was mad at Sonny Stitt for years because I tried to talk to him and I didn't know that he had other things on his mind, like figuring out how what the musicians were going to play on this Kansas City date he had. So he called me junior and it kind of ticked me off. So I tried for a couple of years not to listen to him. Then I came back to my senses and says, you better listen to Stitton and, and try to learn something. Because each of these people, Sonny Stitt, James Moody, oh man. Mm, I'm in the mood for love. Yeah. And Nobody can scat better. That guy is weird in his scat singing because I'm going, I don't know which way he's going. I think he, <laughs> and he's, is so exciting and interesting. And I can go on and on each. So when people say, well, who is your absolute favorite? I said, I love all of them. Yeah. You, can't, you can only, you can only deal with one. I said, well, sometimes I said, but to be honest with you, I can't do without all of them. I mean, I try to figure out why is Paul Gonzalez so beautiful? And what can I learn from that? You know, I like yeah. Fathead Newman. Good Lord. <laughs> you know, there are things Fathead plays. I'm saying, darn, Fathead. Are you uh, doing any recording now? Some, and I want to get back to record, not only for my own edification, but in a way to make what I could do accessible to other people. And that if we get the opportunity, and in my case, I now have to make the opportunity, that it just doesn't um, automatically exist where they come find you and say, we're going to record you because a lot of that is so commercial. And if those, that's the criteria, it may not allow you to do what you can do. It's sort of like when I looked at a CD about uh, Lee Morgan. Lee Morgan was such a beautiful musician that his success could interfere with his future stuff. They wanted him to outdo Sidewinder. <laughs> because Sidewinder was popular. Right, right. They only, you know, we only got, we got to have a hit. Got to have a hit and only a hit. Well, see, he wasn't thinking that way when. When he did Sidewinder. That's right. right. That was the biggest hit that that uh, record company had. Yeah. yeah. Well, see, they're trying to make you outdo yourself. It happens to all these folks, especially pop people. Like, That's right. That's right. Michael Jackson's supposed to outdo himself over and over and over again. You may get away with it a couple of times. In other words, you find some stuff. You find the juju somewhere. Yeah, that connect. <laughs> yeah. But you still got to be working until the next, you know, big hit and connection. Right, but if right. the record companies will say, we're only interested in you if you can provide us with a hit which sells a million, a million and a half copies. Or That's two the only million. thing they're interested in. Yeah. Dollars and cents. And so, not cents, they're interested in the dollars. That affects, obviously, what you're thinking about because they, they got you chasing the wrong thing. Yes. Well, I got another question for you. We're getting close to wind-up time here, and I, I hate that. We're gonna have, I'm going to have to have you to... If the time prevails, come back again and uh, sit back in with me again. I'm really getting educated today. I've already picked out what I'm going to wear on parts uh, three and four. <laughs> all righty, all right. <laughs> Dr. Smith, what, uh, what advice could you give young and up-and-coming songwriters, musicians, vocalists? What, can, what encouragement could you give them today? Well, you've got to do what you believe 
and you just got to work with it. Understanding that we live in this particular society that tries to commoditize everything for a buck, that can interfere with your development, but you got to do what you believe and you got to know what you are interested in. And if you run into difficulties, you might have to approach it like a John Cole train, you know, write a musical exercise, even if it's meant as a stepping stone to something else. Okay. You know, rather than say, I've got to be number one this week or this year, it doesn't really work like that. Because if you're depending on the fickle, controlled, manipulated masses, you may be dead 20 years before they have <laughs> sense enough to know. Damn, sit, sit, was, sit back, sit back. Yeah. Darn, that was a good thing. How did we miss it? But if we did what we truly felt, we may get, I mean, that's no consolation. You get rediscovered. Yeah, yeah. Like they say, but damn, how did we miss it? Well, we miss things because everything is clogged up with the BS and with the flavor of the moment. And then two, only individuals who are free know what they believe is good. The mass of people don't know what's good. They look, they go read Time Magazine to figure out what they supposed to like. They don't know. Right. right. The, and many of them are not free. And once they see the crowd wake up and understand that, well, M Manny is doing something. Okay, well, suddenly we like it. But <laughs> They discovered it last week. Suppose you've been doing your programs for 20 years or more. I were on the road to doing these things. And I look at the long, I didn't get into jazz to become wealthy, <laughs> you know? And most people in their right minds understand that. Now, I'm not against popularity if you like something good, but I'm not gonna get too carried away with that because I'm working on some other stuff. Right, right. And that's the way any of these folks were. Uh, whether it's train, uh, they have so much stuff going on. Uh, Sonny, you just keep working because you keep living. Right, right. Just keep putting your, your best foot forward is what, you, what you're telling us, is that right? Right, and see, we have to understand the political and economic contradictions of this slaveocracy, you know. Well, I, I have- uh... That's a factor, and, and some people are hesitant to say it, but if you have to get rediscovered and you finally can say it to the world or what you say is revealed, then that's great. But the reason why you're doing this program is similar to what a friend was telling me. Is so much craziness going on that if it weren't for the people on the local level opening up the meaning of what this music is and could be, a great number of people would never know. In other words, all the musicians didn't need to go to New York. Right. There were musicians who stayed in D.C. who are a bridge to all this other stuff. In other words, the reason why we may know about some of the great people is because of the work on a local level that the people who didn't go, they may have driven a cab or worked in the post office. Yeah. But, but they practice and they play. That's an extra burden. And they maintain high standards, the book heels of the world. There's not enough room for more than one Sonny Stitt, regrettably. You know, Stitt is good. Buck Hill is good. It's a whole boatload. Look at all these players that we know. Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking about trying to put together a, uh, a summit of alto saxophone players. Mm. Uh, the Herb Scott's that's running loose. <laughs> uh, What's, what's the other guy's name? Uh, Antonio Parker. Antonio Parker. Now I'm talking to Antonio 
he had heard of me and he said, and what do you play? I look, I said, I play the same thing you play. And well, see, that's amazing. He hasn't had a chance to hear me. Thankfully, I've had a chance to hear him. Right, right. And he's playing uh, from Howard, Marshall Keys. He was at Howard when I was there. David Yardborough wasn't really attending, but he was hanging around. And uh, I have a lot of students that came through me at uh, Northern Virginia Community College. And they're all around the world. Yeah, yeah. You know, well, I have a, I have a uh, last question for you. We're just we're just about out of time, and I would like to ask you this question. And it's and and much as I hate, would like to sum up this interview with this last question for you. And uh, what is what is jazz to Herb Herb Smith? Oh boy. You're gonna you you gonna make me uh, sit back. Think of what monk <laughs> monk said freedom, and okay. I, I people said freedom. How can we get our teeth into that? Well, well, that's what it is. Beyond just knowing notes and knowing chords, suppose you know notes and chords, but you're not free. And you're not trying to create anything that embodies the spirit of freedom, creativity. You know, you don't have the courage to do that. So that's what it means to me that it's an ongoing project. And, and people laugh. They say, what do you mean you still chasing Bird? I said, yeah, Bird was that damn good. <laughs> I'm chasing I said, not only am I chasing bird, I'm chasing train. Yeah. If, it wasn't, if it wasn't bad enough to be ha to have to chase bird, how about chasing train? How about chasing Cannonball Adley? Good Lord of mercy. <laughs> you, you know, I'm just, I am amazed. I'm yeah. amazed at all of it, you know, and I'm inspired. You know, I could spend a whole week rounding up a lot of stuff of David Fathead Newman. I'm saying, darn, David. Yeah, yeah. There's yeah. a whole list of these people that without them, man, look look at what they've given us. Yeah, yeah. And this is just, let's just say, this is saxophone. But what about trumpet? Bass, drums, piano. Oh, Lord yeah. have mercy. Yeah that it, it, there is no end, that you have inspiration. To me, jazz is, is like uh, trying to get to the end of the tunnel. You can see it, but you can never get to it. Right. You know. And, and I'm, I'm glad. I'm glad to, I'm glad to be alive. I hear you. And to, um, to pursue, I want to call it uh, divinity that which is divine, to try to reach some levels of that, which is perfection, you know, and that's a laudable goal, but that doesn't come easy. You can't no, go no. buy that, you know. Well, I, yes. I've got $10,000. Can I just buy it? Well, no. hey, 20. How about 20? I'm going to take out a loan. You, you can't, You've got to evolve through all of that. And that's like mastering these levels. Enough to live, we may get closer. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> but Doc, you have uh, given me a lesson today. I mean, I haven't put many questions in there because I've been too busy listening and absorbing what you've been uh, sending out to us. And... Uh, I, again, I thank you for your your creativity, and and I, I'm glad we finally got a chance to do this. Well, you know? one final thing, right quick, and that okay. is, I did not come up with this. I am blessed in the sense that this is what the people gave me, the people, and this is what some of those so-called artists gave me. This is what they taught me. I didn't. You know, Leon Thomas taught me. Sonny Rollins taught me. Yeah, yeah. 
Train taught me to eat up the ego. Train taught me to stand on the same stage with other saxophone players. Because I was, I went to see Train and I said, I don't want to see these other guys. Who are these other guys? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what was Train it. telling us? Yeah. Train was saying, not only listen to me, how about listening to these guys too? That's what I get from Sonny, is that what about the rest of these drummers? It's, it's not just one drummer. You said it, these drummers. <laughs> yeah. yeah. By the way, whose hands are all blazing? <laughs> Man, you have really touched my heart and my soul today. And uh, I just got to remind our guests, uh, you've been listening to uh, Speaking of Jazz with me, Manny Kellogg, and I'm your host. And as you've been listening, I'm bringing it to you live and straight from the hip every week. And uh, this, this program and this show is being brought to you by Daryl Craig Harris, Music Matters in Las Vegas, Nevada and also uh, Mr. Nigel J. Farmer, Jazz Tribe News, and he's a producer and publisher from uh, Southwest France. And those guys are making the show possible. And uh, again, Dr. Smith, man, thank you so much for your time. I'm, I'm sorry we're out of time, but uh, we're going to do this again, Doc. Well, <laughs> I've got to, uh, I, uh, I'm trying to figure out what to eat. <laughs> because I want to uh, get uh, editions four, five, six. The sky is the limit. The sky is the limit. <laughs> and we, hey, man, again, thank you for your time. God bless your heart. And uh, I'm looking forward to doing it again sometime, doctor. Yeah. And as I always say, God bless and keep swinging. Yeah. Take care right. now. Until next time. Bye-bye. We hope you enjoyed this show and thank you for keeping jazz alive. Don't forget to follow us on our social media channels. All the links are in the podcast description. <laughs>